Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We're rolling, y'all. We're a nation of immigrants, a country with roots in other soils. Nowhere is that more true than in the country of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, inviting you to tune in to A Taste of Louisiana and a new series dedicated to our food heritage. Louisianians are descendants of seven primary nations that have influenced every dish we cook today. Welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. Representative, how are you doing? Thanks for that good deal. Hey, Don, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Glenn, always good to have you. How y'all doing, Don? <laughs> how y'all doing? <laughs> good. Oh, my God, y'all look beautiful out here. Y'all, thanks so much for being here in the kitchen with me today as we continue to showcase all of the great cultures and all of the wonderful cuisines that make Louisiana the great food state that it is. And all of the Germans in the audience today because we are actually cooking the foods of the Germans of the German coast. Most people around the country, I'm assuming here, may not know that there's a, just it was a predominant uh, German culture in Louisiana still today, and in fact, we still have a coast in Louisiana called the German Coast. We're brewing beer today, we're cooking two or three great uh, German dishes, we're going out of, the, uh, out of the kitchen to do a boucherie, and y'all, I'm feeding every one of you. I hope you all brought you, I hope you all got a ticket. <laughs> The first group of Germans to arrive in Louisiana ultimately settled in the river parishes on the outskirts of New Orleans. They made such an impression on the French leadership with their strong work, work ethic and commitment to survival that more and more German farmers were requested. Many German families still live along the historic river road. My good friend Glenn Falgu shares the story of what has come to be known in Louisiana as the German Coast. Governor Bienville and Charles Friedrich Dierensberg, a Swiss officer and leader of the 300 German immigrants arriving in Louisiana, would locate on the Mississippi River's west bank, 25 miles above New Orleans near present-day Hanville. Charles Friedrich Dierensberg. He was a Swiss officer who was chosen a year after the first sail, uh, ship sailed to bring some 300 uh, let's call them soldiers, with him to be part of that settlement. He was a, a well-respected leader amongst all the Germans. The Germans arrived in the winter of 1722, and this area became known almost immediately as Côte des Allemands, or the German coast. Over time, the German coast stretched for miles along the Great River Road, establishing many of our present-day communities. Uh, the first village was called Marenthal and that's where Union Carbide is today. The second village was called Augsburg, and that's pretty much where the Waterford uh, nuclear plant is today. Marenthal was built on an old European design about a half a mile off of the Mississippi River. Augsburg was built on kind of a lane, a street, from the river to the back. Both of those communities were wiped out during the 1722 hurricane. Um, from that was born the wisdom of the ages of the river road. Hoffen was the name of that community, and Hoffen stretched along the Mississippi Road, River Road from where today is Hanville is today, and all the way to the St. John the Baptist Parish line. 
colony officials expected an abundant harvest that first year and the industrious Germans delivered. The Germans fed themselves and sold their surplus harvest to the government to feed New Orleans. German agriculture became critical to the survival of the city and saved it twice from famine. When they came, the governor knew that he could depend upon them to raise the crops and the vegetables despite any odds. And so they, with their devotion to the land, he knew that they would be able to produce the necessary crops to save the soldiers that were now making up New Orleans. By 1732, the Germans supplied New Orleans markets with vegetables, herbs, butter, eggs, and poultry. Their farming accomplishments encouraged the French authorities to request more German colonists, and the German coast soon became known as the Garden of the Capital. They were certainly growing tobacco, which was a cash crop that went to the company, all of the profits. But they were also producing things like corn, and potatoes and beans and peas and of course they were producing rice and uh, Johann Jacob Faust in some of the early records was a rice producer as well as a shoemaker. The Germans who settled in Louisiana in the 1720s were primarily from the southern area of Germany including places such as Alsace, Lorraine, the Palatinate, Strasbourg, Baden and Bavaria. Cattle raising and butchering were also important in their smokehouses hung venison, sausage, beef, and ham. Rabbit pies, roasted ducks, or roasted squab resulted from wild game hunts. According to the early documents of the 1722-1725 period, there literally was no animals. There was no cattle, no oxen, no horses. Now that changed in time as the money started to roll in and certainly by the 1730s they were being provided with animals and in exchange for that they were provi providing milk and butter and various other things. Though the Germans did not have spring houses, many dug deep wells in which their milk, butter and eggs were suspended. The water table from the Mississippi River kept these perishable foods cool. An ingenious people, the Germans created dishes such as meat and seafood filled vegetables. They created rice and meat dressings as well as sweet fod dressing using yams and rice combined with beef and pork. Amazingly, these unique German recipes have been handed down from generation to generation and descendants along Lake de Zalimont and the River Road still prepare these delicacies today. Y'all, what need? I, what, what, what more need I say about the industrious Germans? The French wanted more of us, and in fact, twice, not once, the Germans saved the city of New Orleans from starvation, and of course, gave us great music like we have right over here. Bob Cheney with the uh, accordion over there. Let's give him a hand. Uh, I, when I think of, when I think of what they had to do to survive on the uh, German coast, it's just absolutely incredible. And we're going to share a lot of those stories today with a great friend of mine who you just saw in that little uh, that little historical package, Glenn Falgu, a great historian on German Louisiana. Glenn, nice to have you. Andrew Capone is with the uh, Fort Butler Foundation, and uh, and of course we have Don Caskey as a beer maker. How can you do a German show without beer making? And then uh, then Representative Joe Toomey, who represents that area of the Germans in Gretna, Louisiana. We'll give him a hand too. <laughs> Y'all, when I think of the, uh, uh, the dishes that I could cook, you heard about this, uh, uh, you, you heard about the meats, the wild game, everything. I, I just imagine what I could have in these pots today. But they were fabulous butchers, and the Germans actually brought to Louisiana much of the cattle industry, and of course the dairy industry, where we get our milk, butter, cheese, and of course uh, beer making as well. So I decided to do one of the oldest dishes that I remember from my grandmother's house on Lake Desalman, that great lake you saw behind. Uh, that shot just a minute ago. Every time we went to her, uh, her home, she always had a big bowl of what you may call uh, rice dressing without the rice, just the meat. She called it fire dressing, F-A-R-R-E. 
fire. Now, I have searched that name out forever. So I'm thinking that it was probably just some kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe just neighborhood name for this particular dish on the German coast. They made it with venison. They made it with rabbit. They made it with ground duck and goose meat. Uh, but her preferred way was with a combination of uh, beef and pork. And before I, I, I have some already uh, uh, cooking here, but before I get there, I want to show you the raw ingredients. What goes into this sweet fire dressing? There's fired and there's sweet fired. To make it sweet, you put in sweet potatoes. That's all a good mixture of sweet potatoes. We'll turn this meat dressing slightly sweet, but the sweet potatoes disappear. We have ground beef, ground pork, uh, beef kind of holds its texture in cooking like a good hamburger. Of course, pork gives it its nice flavor and fat and the juiciness of the meat. And then always chicken liver, always chicken liver in this. Remember the boudins and all of this had chicken livers in it uh, as well. So all of this, I've, I've taken the meat and into the pot. And Keith, if you look down into the pot right here, I've browned this meat really nicely, y'all. I've combined it and I've been cooking it here because you want to cook it long and slow. And the longer you cook it, the more it caramelizes. And of course, then you're going to have a great flavor in this meat. If you just try to just kind of cook it for five minutes, no flavor at all. Don't invite me to your house if you do that. I, mean, I want a long cook, y'all, a long cook. Uh, so, Glenn, while this is uh, sautéing here, you know, you and I were talking earlier about most of the Germans coming to Louisiana uh, actually didn't arrive here first. They went to the Arkansas, and many came as indentured servants, right? Many were burdened by indentured uh, contracts or being bound to produce, but they became very unhappy. And, 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 and why, why were they indentured servants? I mean, they were half, uh, I, I wouldn't say part of, a, a, a part of slavery, but yet at the same time, they had to commit a certain amount of what they did to the colony. Why was that? Uh, they were promised to commit to produce crops to help save and serve the soldiers. And uh, in the Arkansas area, it, the conditions were brutal, and it didn't last long. Now, y'all, onions, celery, bell pepper, all down in here. Now, a little bit garlic. Germans love garlic. Oh, uh, hey, look, Germans love garlic. Y'all know that. We love onion, celery, bell pepper. We love garlic, too. Now, oh, can you smell this out there? The liver. I know a lot of people are saying, I don't know if I like liver or not. Well, you know what? This is going to disappear because we boil it and we've chopped it, and it's all going down into that pot, and then it's going to cook for an hour or so here, so you'll never know it was in there. And then, of course, a little bit of the uh, sweet potato. Now the sweet potato is going to just cook, a, cook away here really uh, nice. Now I have uh, some beer. Everybody has their beer? Huh? Everybody, everybody has it? Don Caskey brought beer. Don, thank you so much. Tell us about this real fast. Uh. Well, on May 13th we had a my fest at the German Cultural Center. Right. And Heinrich Orlick, who's a brewmaster at Heinerbrau in Covington. Right. Uh, yeah, Covington. Came down and he was the actual brewmaster for this. This is a Hefenweiss. It's going to be a little cloudy. But it's good. It's a little cloudy. Let me look. <laughs> Don't tell me beer won't go good in this dressing, y'all. We're going to cook it. It's going to sit here and simmer. We're going to add a little bit stock to it. If you can add water, of course, the early Germans would have. I have a little chicken stock here. It's just going to continue to tenderize this meat. So as it cooks, long and slow. You don't want to see anything in this pot other than meat cooked all the way down. In fact, I have some right here. I want you to see what it looks like when it's all cooked down into the pot. Take a look at this. You see, it looks like a nice dressing. Of course, you can mix it with rice. Normally about one spoon of meat to two spoons of rice with a little green onions or parsley. And then, of course, the way we did it at the house, uh, we took the croustant, the end of the bread, uh, and we filled it up with that. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking, huh? huh? Yeah, you might think this is for you. <laughs> Like many other cultures, the Germans celebrated the bushery or the hog killing in the winter months. This labor-intensive task provided fresh meat as well as smoked and salted meats for all of the families that participated. There was music, there was home-brewed beer, there was fresh pork cooked to order right on the site. Join my brothers, me, and a couple of our really good friends as we celebrate a traditional bushery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Large cauldrons of boiling water on a winter morning in Louisiana means just one thing. It's hog killing time. 
Like many cultures, the Germans celebrate the bushery in the colder months of the year and make the work less difficult by bringing in neighbors and friends. A 200 to 300 pound pig is slaughtered. Blood is captured from the juggler vein and salt added immediately to prevent coagulation. Later, this blood is combined with meat to create the boudin rouge or red boudin. Scalding water is poured over the pig so that the butchers can scrape and remove the bristles easily. After the hog is washed with soap and rinsed with cold water, the butchers begin to cut and quarter the pig into chops, roast, and bacon. While the butchering continues, griots, the backbone or neck meat, is smothered with seasonings and then served over grits for breakfast. The head, feet, and ears are boiled with shoulder roast and seasonings for about two and a half to three hours. Once the meat is tender and falling off the bone, it is strained, then carefully picked over to make sure that all of the bones are removed. The tender meat is broken apart. Gelatin, vinegar, and additional seasonings are added. In just six to eight hours, the hog's head cheese gels and it's ready to eat. Boudin is a combination of liver, fat, and Boston butt or the front shoulder roast. The meat is seasoned with salt, pepper, and cayenne and cooked for about an hour and a half. Once tender, the meat is placed through a meat grinder. At this point, three different types of boudin are created. Boudin with meat only, boudin with meat mixed with rice, and that famous boudin rouge or blood sausage. The casings are stuffed, then the sausages are cooked in boiling water for about 10 to 15 minutes. Crackling are made from the skin and fat of the pig. The skin is cut into squares, then placed in a cast iron pot of boiling water. The crackling cook for about two hours, rendering the lard that will then be used for cooking, baking, or even preserving meat. When the cracklings look clear, the heat is increased. The cracklings continue to cook, but when you see that blue smoke emerging from the kettle, it's time to remove them from the pot and drain. They're then salted, and as they cool, you can hear them snap pop and crackle. The Cadillac of crackling are those that have that little bit of meat attached to the skin. Fresh sausage is made for immediate use while many links are smoked and saved for later. Ondue sausage is made from cubed meat that's seasoned well with salt, black, and red pepper. Ondue links are always smoked for several hours over pecan wood or a little bit oak and they'll add great flavor to beans, casseroles, jambalayas, and gumbo. At the end of an intense day of butchering, cooking, eating, enjoying good music, and a little homebrew beer, the bounty of the bushery emerges. Boudin, crackling, hogshead cheese, fresh sausages, ondue, and smoked ham. Everybody goes home with their portion of the slaughter and everyone eats well for weeks until they come together again for that next bushery in Bayou Country. <laughs> Y'all, what, hey, what a great morning that was. A little drizzle about 6 o'clock in the morning. The sun was coming up. It was cold as could be. But there was griots on the fire, so we, were, we had a great time with the bushery and, of course, all of the different meats. Uh, it reminded me about a very famous lady in New Orleans, uh, Madame Biguet, who was married to a butcher. In fact, Two Jacks Restaurant in New Orleans now was the home of a Madame Biguet's restaurant. And her husband, Hippolyte, was a butcher in the market, and uh, she actually was one of the first women restaurateurs in the city. This is in the late 1800s, and it was because of her serving those little griots and liver and onions and sausages and all of this around 10 o'clock in the morning after the butchers had been working so from about, what, 3 o'clock? They'd make their way over to Madame Biguet's and she would have that second breakfast for them. And a lot of times we think that that may be the origin of brunch if we think about it in New Orleans where people came to have that second breakfast about 10 in the morning. Uh, again, a lot of debate over all of that, but good story and I love Madame Biguet. She did liver and onions and I love liver and onions. It's not what I'm cooking right now though. So uh, y'all, what, what are we cooking? You saw the fresh sausages. Can you imagine doing a German uh, cooking segment without sausages? So I have some sauteing in the pan here right now and I want, I want you to look at this. I have 
some fresh uh, beef and fresh pork. One of the things about the butchers, they love to combine their meats. And in Louisiana, we still combine seafood with meats, vegetables with meat. We stuff melatonin, eggplant with shrimp and ground beef and ground pork. We're always combining things. This dish is no different. We're also putting apples in it. Why, you see these apples? These apples are from my tree at my house. This is the Anna apple, it's a Louisiana apple. The Germans were growing apples in Louisiana. Here, Randy, right, are you ready for it, huh? Take a bite out of that, huh? Y'all, that's my culinary, uh, this is all my instructors from my culinary school here at Nichols State University. Thank y'all uh, for coming, absolutely. Okay, so, um, so we have our sausages here, and I have some already frying. And look what I did, Keith. I, I took a pork sausage, and I took a beef sausage, and I wrapped it together in a circle here. And let me see if I can get them out. Um, think I can get them out of here? Because um, I got to turn them over. Oh, there you go. Right there. And you see how beautiful they are? Whoo, take a look at that. Just gorgeous. Now, what would we put on top of this? I'm gonna let the bottom, you know in German cooking and French cooking and Louisiana cooking, we want caramelization. We want that good gratiné on the bottom of the pot so that we can get that good meat flavor in everything we cook. So I'm gonna add a little bit onions on top of this, a little bit celery, a little bit uh, bell pepper we're gonna put. Uh, and while I'm adding this, y'all, I have to ask Glenn about the large percentage of Germans that actually died trying to make a new life in Louisiana and trying to get here as well, including that walk across France. You know, it was massive, the, the amount of loss, and it kind of staggers the mind because they say that some of the writing cities started out as many as 12,000, but of course it came down to about 4,000. But when they reached Louisiana, they continued to die, and what was left was about 300 at the German coast. And, uh, and uh, Jill, you know, we have a great representative from uh, Louisiana here and serves in the House of Representatives. And, uh, and, and, you, and, and you actually uh, uh, represent that area. What's the, being done with preservation of the German coast and German culture? Well, the reason to preserve it is the, where the city of Gretna is now was originally founded as the village of McCannaham by German settlers, right. and most of which were related to the uh, railroad industry. Uh, just in the past legislative session, we were able to uh, recognize the German Cultural Center in Gretna as the official state uh, cultural center. Now, y'all, I have the onions, the celery, the bell pepper, the garlic. You see, I added a lot of garlic again. I know y'all love that. And, uh, and then I'm going to add a little apple cider. You could add beer naturally. You could add uh, a beer right here. And then, of course, a little bit of the stock a little bit of that wonderful stock. You can use a beef stock, a pork stock, whatever, because this is beef and pork. Now what I would do would be to top it with some of those Louisiana apples. Glenn, what about the lasting contributions of the uh, Germans? Anything, I know a lot stands out, but when we talk about the contributions today, what do you think about? Well, one of the finest contributions comes from the professor, J. Hanno Dealer, who wrote the small book called The Germans of Creole Descent around 1909. Right. And it's kind of sort of become the Bible of studies. Of course, there's been many, many other books written. Right. What you're doing here today is, uh -huh. a, is the best form of per the preservation. preservation huh? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, uh, me, me and a lot of other people, I'm on the bottom of the totem pole, but there's so many people doing great work to preserve not only our great German culture, but all of the cultures that make Louisiana unique. And that's why you ought to come over here and visit us and eat some of our good food. We're welcoming you with open arms, y'all. I have sausage in the oven. Y'all ready? Huh? Ready to take it out, huh? Whew. I'm going to show you what it looks like because the sausage goes into the oven at about 350 degrees. It's going to stay in that oven for about an hour. The longer, the better. Don't overcook it. It's got good juice here. Y'all ready to take a look at this? <laughs> Whoo, bon dieu, saint uh, huh? Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that absolutely beautiful? And y'all, that would be served on a nice piece of, of, uh, of bread or over rice or over mashed potatoes. I could go on and on. And look at here, the apples, and I've sauteed apples as a dessert with a little 
apple ratifia, a brandy made by the Germans using brandy and apples in an old crock. And this would become a dessert. It would go inside of pastry shells. It would be absolutely, uh, so many great dishes from the Germans. I love those folks. Y'all, time flies when you're enjoying good food and great conversation with friends in the kitchen. Thank you so much for stopping by as we continue to explore our unique food heritage and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. We appreciate you. To purchase the Encyclopedia of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Bowles, featuring more than 750 traditional recipes, a CD-ROM of the book, or a copy of the program featuring all three episodes of Today's Culture, call the number on your screen. Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all.